on uh, Harry Fell and we talked about the Balloon and Bike Project at MIT from 1974. I had planned to do this with Mark Rosenbaum, who really, I think, was responsible for most of the design that came out of this project, but he lives on Walter's Vineyard, and it's pretty hard to get here from there. In fact, I'm not sure you can get anywhere from there. So uh, he sent me his thesis, most of it, uh, last week, and I put this together. And uh, I'll show you what I know. Meanwhile, I did bring my example of the aluminum frame I built in that project, and I'll talk about that too. So um, that's Mark, who was 19 and a senior at MIT. So in 1974, Mark was an undergraduate at MIT in mechanical engineering. And um, at MIT, in any major but math, you have to write an undergraduate thesis. That's why there were lots of us who were math majors. Um, and Mark decided that he wanted to, his goal was to build an extremely strong, light, stiff bicycle. Um, he wanted to be ultra light, but not sacrifice stiffness. Uh, interestingly, uh, a quote from Marx he pointed out uh, was that you know, stiffness was more important than strength. Racing bicycles never broke during races. That's what he said. Frames never break in normal racing conditions, which indicates that strength is not a problem. That was before carbon fiber bikes. <laughs> Things really have changed. So, how light? He wanted to go after something really light, and at the time, yeah, he was going to build a track frame. That leaves a lot of stuff off mine. It's also a track frame because I really wanted a big skier bike at the time. Get back to my part of it later. So normal track bikes at the time weighed 18 or 19 pounds, so it's interesting to note that these days they have to weigh at least 15 pounds. So again, materials have changed considerably. I mean, there are surely lighter bikes, but they put this lower restriction on the weight for track racing. Um, as an example of what was around the bicycle that was made for Eddie Merckx, when he set his one hour record, amazing record of almost 31 miles in an hour. How often do we even ride at 31 miles per hour, let alone keeping it up for an hour? The bike weighed 13.25 pounds. That's uh, a lot lighter than going 18 or 19 pounds it was a very light steel frame, custom built. It had uh, titanium handlebars, stem, and seat post, partially plastic pedals, um, 24 spoke wheels, tires expected to last at most four hours on a smooth track. <laughs> the components were all drilled out, so it was absolutely not designed for strength or to last. It was designed for this event. Um, there also, at the time, there were Raleigh made of. Uh, lightweight bike, even lighter than this, but it didn't really get used for anything, go anywhere, you know, the details on that. So what did Mark do? That's a picture of Mark's bike, and uh, we'll look at it in detail at some of the parts. It looks like a bike, it really is a traditional arrangement. So, uh, light and stiff were his goals. Mark, Mark's bike proved to be, at that time anyway, the world's lightest track bicycle. He did this for his undergraduate thesis. It, uh, in there, weighed 12 pounds, 5 ounces in total. He did more than just build that frame. He built everything on it. And I'll show you some of the pieces. The bike is currently at the MIT Museum, and when we plan this, we hope to borrow it from them and bring it here, because I couldn't even get Mark here. I couldn't get the bike either. Um, <laughs> So, some design guidelines. One of them was to use larger diameter tubular components. Strength goes up with the cube of the diameter. Of course, to keep things light, if you're going to make things bigger, you have to make the walls thinner on the tubing. So there's, you know, some kind of compromise. And he did a lot of study. I mean, that's really a lot of, it's documented in his thesis, and we'll post it as soon as I get page 10 from him. Uh, on SheldonBrown.com. So, uh, yeah, larger diameter tubes with thinner walls. Um, use of seal bearings. That was not very common at the time, and uh, I guess the bottom bracket just sort of appeared around the end. 
Um, so he used steel bear bearings all around, and they were light, they were more precision, not vulnerable to contamination, and he used those in the axles and in the bottom bracket. Um, so sacrificing adjustability. The bike he made can it raise the saddle up and down, things like that. I mean, nothing on it is adjustable. It's all designed to fit him. And it was put together to fit him because that really could save a lot of weight. And then to use alloys, well, steel's an alloy too. And he did a careful study of several possibilities. He settled on for the frame, the 6061 T6 aluminum, because it was good for welding. So, um, yeah, he looked at uh, possible materials. I forget which things I have. Click here. Uh, magnesium is best per unit weight, best for comprehensive buckling, but it's brittle and difficult to work with. Aluminum is easier to weld, and especially the right aluminum, and it's more than twice efficient as steel against compressive buckling. He also looked at titanium. He did use some titanium in his axles. Um, it was more expensive to work with, and again, the aluminum was easier to fabricate with. And of course, steel was there all around. He felt it he really, he really couldn't go with, say, wider and thinner steel tubes, because steel tubes were already incredibly thin, and there was sort of no room to move in that direction with steel. All right. Uh, we don't have to look at this in detail, it's just I threw in one table straight from his thesis uh, of what he settled on for the dimensions of the tubes. And they're the same as they are in mine. As, as all, the, all the pieces are pretty much like that. Alright, so some of the other things he built for it, the rear hub he used a different aluminum alloy because he wasn't going to have to weld 2024 T4 aluminum. I think he's stronger, but again, less weldable, but that wasn't necessary. He bored it out for precision sealed bearings, used a hollow titanium axle, and the whole hub weighed 5 ounces as opposed to 11.5 ounces for the standard hubs at the time, rear track hubs. Front hub, similar construction, just, you know. Don't have to look at those details again. Weight only three ounces as opposed to nine ounces for similar conventional. Pedals. He made his own pedals. In mean, his thesis, he describes how he balanced the axle in the right place for the pedals, the platform pedals. You know, uh, we didn't have cleats. Yeah, the cleats were around at the time, kind of hammered into the sole of your shoe, but mostly he was just riding on a platform pedal with a toe strap. So his platform pedals and toe straps came to 7.5 ounces. He points out that's not just 5 ounces less than normal, but that's also rotating energy, which, you know, rotating weight, which really could be worse than just up-down weight. Um, yeah, I don't have a, there wasn't a picture of his bottom bracket, but I know it's the same as mine. Um, but also the whole description of it, that's page 10. And for some reason, the thesis he sent me was missing page 10. I now have the details of that, but I didn't have time. I came so late to go through with them, looking at them. Um, pretty nifty saddle. It's just sort of stuck on there. That's where it was right for Mark. Definitely not adjustable. That's one of the cutest parts of the bike. Handlebars and stem. Well, notice where the handlebars are. They're at the bottom of the stem, right? They're attached to the fork crown. And uh, this is a funny picture from the side, but you'll see it again. I'll come back to the whole bike. Uh, it cuts a whole pound off the weight. I mean, he, they're shorter handlebars because he basically just has the, the drops and mounted them low. So they're right where he wanted them to be and quite rigid. So looking at the whole bike again, you can see. It's like one of the the handlebars yeah. coming from the bottom there. Uh, pretty impressive job all around. <laughs> okay, well, how did I come into this? That's me. Um, I, was, well, I went to MIT, I went there much earlier, I'm 10 years older than Mark. So in 1974, 
I was an assistant professor of math at Northeastern University across the river. And uh, I sort of looked over things that MIT ran as independent activity during their independent activities period. I think they were the first place to introduce this idea of January is sort of a waste to let the fall semester run past Christmas and go up to February and students go home and forget to come back and stuff like that. So they ended the first semester in December and had this month off where they let people run courses. They ran some super fast versions of other courses for people who had to catch up, but all sorts of stuff went on. So that particular year, 1974, Sean Buckley offered this aluminum bike project. This was really based on, on uh, Mark's work. He was working on his thesis at the time, and uh, I decided I knew I had to go to this. So I showed up and um, ordered a set of tubes. Now, you basically, you know, Mark had designed everything. He knew what people should have, so we just ordered tubes. We got these boxes of tubes different sizes, and then you were to go out and design yourself a bike using the tubes. Um, I thought this was cool. I mean, in, the, in part, I really, really wanted to use a milling machine and a lathe and those things and get to do all those things. And it took a, took a while before anyone noticed I wasn't a student. <laughs> so, you know, I just go there every Tuesday afternoon. And, um, I got my kit, and you know that's that was it. So the, the job of the students in this class really was to go put this technology to work, design yourself a frame. It was not to, to do new mechanical engineering studies and stuff like Mark really did for his thesis. And uh, I said to work on it. Uh, the question is how this this drawing is actually Mark's because I couldn't find mine. Um, most of the students were you know they had a few things they knew for dimensions on their bikes and they were. MIT students are trying very hard to do all this trigonometry to figure out what all the other dimensions would be. And I instead uh, made a drawing similar to this one. Mine was one inch to two inches. That is a strict half size drawing. I used the dimensions that I actually knew I wanted, you know, top two, down two. Um, and uh, the others fell out. I measured them off the drawing. That's what I made. So I, I really never did any trick, and it worked. I got to say, out of the, all, all those others, lots of them didn't work. The pieces didn't even really come together. The wheels didn't fit in. Whatever, it just worked better to draw a picture and do everything from that. So that's just the front well here. That's it. There. Um, what happened next? I gotta say, the first thing everybody asks when they say, oh, I made this frame is, you did that welding? None of us did the welding. I don't think Mark did his own welding. So, uh, you know, aluminum welding is pretty technical. I wasn't equipped or trained. I was doing a lot of brazing at the time, but uh, not any aluminum welding. So what I did, I machined all the parts. After I decided how big everything should be, I got to use the milling machine and lathes, and I machined all the parts, including you know, the track dropouts, the tubes definitely to fit each other, and, and uh, put them in a jig. That's what we did. We jigged all the pieces and sent them to an aluminum welder. And then came the day to go in to pick up the frame. It really was there. It looked like a frame. and. Uh, Sean told me mine was particularly light and strong. Okay. That was really nice. In fact, he took the frame and put it on its side and stood on it and bounced up and down. He showed me how strong it was. I was sure it was going to snap and go right through it, but it's very still, so I guess it really was particularly strong. Um, though, I'm sure my frame was light and strong because it was small and it needed to fit me. And I, mean, I thought that at the time. You know, if I were 6'4", it wouldn't have been so light and strong. It might have been strong, but it definitely was not going to be so light. Uh, note that Gary Klein also made a frame during that project. You know, I'm sure I've heard of Klein bikes. And toward the end of it, he showed up with even wider tubes. I mean, if you've been close to or on a Klein bike, you know that they have even wider tubes than these. And you know, I remember him coming in with his collection of wider tubes that he was now going to work with. And, go out and build his own frames. 
Okay, so what happened to the frame? And that is my frame. I have this frame now. And at some point, you know, they, they did want to get it on the road. But just then, I moved to France. Here it is. I have this frame. I moved to France. I took it with me. Uh, what I'm writing there is not that frame. It's where Holdsworth, and that picture is while I was writing Harry Press Perry in 1975. Well, you know, I, I really hoped to work on the frame while I was in France. I got as far as putting on a headset and a fork with one of my cycling mates. I, I joined my first club that year, and, and one of the guys worked as a mechanic at the university at where I was at Orsay. And uh, in his shop, I did manage to get that far and put on a headset and a fork. But then I got busy cycling and doing maths, and uh, somehow I never got back to working on the frame. And two years later, hard as I tried, I'm in my second year, I was teaching at Orsay, and then I never did get a permanent post, and I was on a leave of absence from Northeastern. So I came back to the US and back to Northeastern University. Um, but I really was determined to get back, so I left the frame. A huge bag, one of these postal bags with clothes and books, and a pile of sew-ups over the French cellar in France. And uh, I think I made a couple of quick summer trips back, and then I took my family back in 1988, which was a lot of years, right? 12 years. Uh, something else happened in the frame in the intro. The books and clothes were fine, and the sew-ups turned totally hard and were unusable. I thought they'd be aged rubber by then and be very nice to use, but forget it. Don't say sew-ups in French sew um, So, what happened to the frame? Well, in 1983, Cannondale put out their first aluminum bike. And uh, that picture's either in 83 or 4, Cannondale. And Gary Klein sued them. He said he had the patents on aluminum bicycle design, pretty much everything. I read recently that Schwinn actually had put out an aluminum bike but was paying royalties to Gary Klein and Cannondale refused. I mean, I read that on the web recently. I don't know if it's true or not. So, uh, but Cannondale refused. Cannondale claimed that the design was largely from this public domain project and not Gary was not entitled to all the patents he claimed to have. Um, so, of course, they contacted Sean Buckley and Mark, and um, so I have a little message here I just got yesterday from Mark about this. I was subpoenaed in the Cannondale Klein case, gave a six-hour videotape deposition, <coughs> hid my bike in a friend's barn so it couldn't be subpoenaed because he was afraid they'd take it away forever. Patent discovery documents reference my bike and thesis numerous times, and it took Klein almost eight years to be granted a patent. Essentially, they asked, why is Klein's bike different from Rosenbaum's frame? Um, well, they wanted a bike to bring to the trial, and uh, so they asked Sean, and Sean said in the time the project ran, I think it ran one more year, a total of five bikes were built that were particularly light and strong, and so I get a call from Cannondale's lawyer saying, uh, we've heard that you have one of these frames that's particularly light and strong. Can we use it for this trial? And I said, sure, but it's in a friend's cellar in France. <laughs> so the lawyer went to my friends who cooked dinner for him, and he picked up the frame and took it back to Cannondale. And um, that's still on it. <laughs> the, the, the red ink is faded, but I find it quite precious. That's the only decoration really directed on the bike is this defendant exhibit tab. Um, and indeed they kept it for years. Okay, just, you know, I I was busy doing other things. I was not at that point cycling as much as I had been. I was raising a family and a career. Uh, I was married to Shelley Brown at the time. And um, well, this is another little bit that I just found on the web that uh, about Mr. Klein took Cannondale to court for patent infringements, uh, but this part of uh, in a large diameter aluminum frame built by Bill Cook and Harriet Bell. Um, 
I predated Mr. Klein's, which they did. Uh, Cannondale successfully argued that the Klein patent was null and void. I'm not sure if that's totally true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Gary got some patent that had to do with the wider yet tubes. And I, mean, I told the lawyer at the time that I'm sure it would be a split decision of some kind because I felt that Gary came in and did additional design uh, beyond what Mark did or I built into my bike. So, for a framed bicycle. Years later, I got Sheldon to call someone he knew in Cannondale. I said, you know, find the bike, find the frame. You know all these people. So he did. He called and they shipped us the frame. And I thought, oh good, we get it on the road. No. As soon as it arrived, Sheldon hung it way up on this ceiling you know, on the wall in the living room and pointed out to people every time they came into the house. He was very proud of that, but it didn't get out on the roads. The road and that must have been, I don't know, late 1990s, maybe 2000 even. <laughs> then, in May 2005, Sheldon said, what do you want from Mother's Day? And I don't think he ever did give me roses, but <laughs> I said, Sheldon, we've been married about 25 years now. Um, in that time, you put about 40 bikes on the road for yourself. And how about getting that bike out on the road for me? And uh, you did. So, my bike doesn't have all sorts of special homemade parts that I think is the headset I put on. Uh, it does have filled with seal bearings. Put some shins, I over machined it there. I never ride it on rainy days because I, I think there's stuff in there that would rust. Um, and uh, that saddle I just put on, it's a Brooks Cambium, it was a, a, a saddle which only just sort of found the lowest saddle, saddle he could because I really couldn't have it any higher for my height. Uh, there's a whole bunch of junk on it now, as you can see, including you know, my phone so I can ride with GPS. Um, and uh, I just added the bag for Sunday's ride so that I would have battery backup for my 505, which seems to die very quickly on the road. Uh, everything I put on it, uh, Sheldon put on the cyclometer, the cat eye. The other stuff I really put on in such a way that I could take it all off because I love riding this bike with nothing on it. It just, you know, I, I like it empty. Um, in fact, I tell people I carry my cell phone on my AAA card because AAA in Massachusetts, they will pick you up twice a year with your bike and drive you 10 miles. I've never had to do this, but it's very comforting. Why, why bring a toolkit? Just stay with the 10 miles. Uh, so that's uh, my tale. Uh, but, you know, what about these frames? Were they light and strong? And more than anything, durable also, because, I mean, Eddie Merckx's frame was light and strong, but clearly that bike was not made to last. Well, Mark Rosenbaum rode his bike up Mount Washington, Twice, in fact, I just found out. The first year, he wanted to do the race, but they wouldn't allow a fixed gear bike in the race. So he rode it up, you know, outside the race on his own. And then the next year, he got to ride it. He put on, it wasn't fixed gear, it was single speed, but with a freewheel. And they let him ride in the race. Bill Shook, uh, I just found out on the web, rode hits across the US. I don't know whether that was a bike centennial or not, but uh, I guess the bike lasted. And uh, mine didn't get on the road till later, but I ride it all the time, usually 25 to 50 miles, and just love riding it. I know part I love riding it because I made the frame, but in part it's like ice skating. It's a very smooth ride. It's just really different. I, mean, I do most of my riding on my holes were still, uh, but there's something just so smooth about that bike. Yes, it's fixie, that helps, it doesn't have lots of junk on it, but there's something about the aluminum construction that I really find delightfully smooth. So with that, um, there's thanks to these people, Sean Buckley, who I mentioned, all the professors involved were Woody Powers and Steve Luttrell, the staff at Building 35, that's where the shop was, We've never survived without. And uh, Mark mentioned having a lot of contact with Ed Harrow at Raleigh International. Um, just one other thing, just added and crashed my machine this morning, but this was not the first aluminum bikes to get on the road. So, we're in the spirit of this conference. 
in the 1890s, that was a little light put on the road. I really don't know anything about its history or what happened to it or how light and strong it was, but we definitely proceed our lights. came out of that project, not to my knowledge. I think they just were aware of the work and when it produced a very similar body. The though theirs, it seems always, was more similar to Gary's in that they did use wider tubes. I mean, the Cannondale aluminum frames out there have wider tubes than my body. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that Klein did get a patent, I think, either seven or nine years later. Yeah. Did, what, do you know what the patent was for? Is it going to be a design patent, which meant nothing? Yeah, I really don't know. Okay. I really know if there's more stuff there to find out. I do know he eventually sold out to Trek. No, that's. I didn't know that any of this until recently when I started trying to put this together. Yeah. Before I uh, found the mead and fell in love with that, I I write a Klein and I love that one. Um, I understand, though, that they fail, aluminum bikes fail, not gradually, but they kind of just fall apart at one point or have, have serious breaks in them. Have you heard about that? Yeah, but, you know, my frame sat around a long time not getting written, so I don't know if it's in the writing. Um, maybe um, put on 600 to 1,000 miles on it this past year. I mean, I'm writing much more now than I was for years. And, no yeah, it's my minor bike, but I have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with this bike from the 90s. Um, I do see that it has some pretty extreme billeting and, and three dimensionality to it beyond simply tube construction. And it raises the question in my mind whether it's even assembled from tubes. I know there are other 20th century aluminum bicycles that are cast frames or fabricated in other ways. I know the BMW uh, built a bicycle after World War II using scrap military aluminum mm -hmm. that was a cast frame. So I guess what I'm wondering is with the MIT project, what was the novelty? Was it the tube construction or was it the dimensions of the tube or was it the welded joinery or what, what exactly was the novelty of, of Mark's MIT project? Well, as I said, I think his goal was to make something particularly light and stiff. Okay, and um, he compared different materials. Definitely, yes, his tubes were, I think, wider than what anything has been used and thinner. But that they were still strong oh, enough and, to work. And his, his MIT project, I guess, was, was not geared toward patentability. That was what That's right. And he, he never went forward with trying to. He does solar heating. Uh, as the Sean Buckley, um, so they neither of them are well. What? It was for them. It was a project and B a hobby. Right. That's right. Not but not for business. So I just get, get, I guess just to clarify this patent dispute between Cannondale and Klein, the patents that Klein either attempted to or took out and then was challenged on, what was their knowledge? We don't know. We don't know. See, next conference. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. We'll be there. <laughs> yes. And Marx went around the machine where he's doing weight reduction. Did he look at spokes, uh, desk, and did he look at monocoques? Monocoque, single, single. No, he, uh, not that to my knowledge, but he, <coughs> he did make very light wheels also. I mean, some of this is documented in his thesis. And um, he. They were 24 spoke, I think they were 36 spoke wheels. But uh, you know, he, he was used very light spokes <coughs> indeed. Yes. Uh, in the 1880s, um, James in Birmingham, England, uh, made an ordinary, a racing ordinary, and it was 11 pounds. Wow. Uh, <coughs> He didn't even have a mounting step on it. You could uh, get them on, on a mounting stool. Uh, 
but it apparently was safe. Wow. And, uh, and lasted. One races, yes. You'll have to find out more about that. Yes. On, on a completely different topic, but one that you can probably speak to, uh, I am completely reliant on the Shel Sheldon Brown website. Good. And <laughs> what, what's the future of that? Well, John Allen's been writing a lot of new material for it and updating pages, and I've been working the web and cleaning up a code that got started in 1995 and is all different all over the place. It's pretty uniform now, so I've been working hard making it more maintainable. Wrote a little bit for it, and John is really doing a great job trying to update material. And other people have been contributing too. And, and I mean, is there an organization? Is there a sustainability? There's two of us. I think component? right now it's two of us managing it all, and we're, you know, we work on it every day. Well, thank you very much. Quite a following.